I do say Oliver Tuscany Cromwell Renzi Smith Smith Smithing Resington Fourth Viscount of Dunning upon Newcastle. I do appreciate the new carriage you have inherited from your grandmother, the king's elderly mistress. The seats are like sitting on a pile of orphans and nubile Turkish boys. I dare say it is even comfier than the very nubile Turkish boys that belong to Lord Kitchener's valet running down to Cuba with a load of sugar. Thank you kindly, Vicar Reginald Chapelbees, local child wrangler and art thief. I too do appreciate the marble finish on the orphan skin seats that the local garage maker applied to my own side of the garage. I sat on the edge of the road there. It looked unmistakably like an ugh, urchin. I do not know, lest we stop to find out. We could stop to find out. A capital idea! Lang Fortington Smythe, my ever so loyal butler, stop this garage! I sure do like sitting on the roadside, eating my orphanage gruel flavored hot pockets. And this new hat is very fashionable, like the shopkeep said. You there, young ruffian. Be you an urchin? Uh, maybe? I don't know. I just wanted to sit here and talk about high culture while eating my lunch of depressing orphanage gruel. Oh, how ghastly! Gruel shall not do. Vicar Chapelbees, I do believe we are part of this high culture the bear cat talks of. Should we behest him to join us and explain his research into it? I have no qualms with such an idea. Come, Burkett, we shall be enlightened for the rest of our journey, too. Ugh, scumthorpe. Why does this keep happening to me? Okay, but if you're taking me, you gotta have some room for that title card. I do beg your pardon, what the devil is a title card? You'll find out. The story will continue after this. High culture is a subset, or well, inverse, of popular or common culture. It's more culture of the upper classes, high society, or the intelligentsia. Hence the term high. Stuff like poetry, fine art, and fancy theater activities including ballet or opera. It can easily be said that if it requires you to keep away from popular things and dress formally, it's high culture. This is why you don't see people like this at the Bolshoi or SF MoMA. And conversely, why you don't see someone like this at a brawl outside the Irish pub in any working class neighborhood, or the Bolshoi. High culture is very isolated from what the general public considers entertainment. Bear cat, what do you mean by us being isolated from these hoi polloi and their popular barbarian culture? Oh yeah, that's gonna be a story of itself. Since time immemorial, people who have been better off like to differentiate themselves and flaunt their wealth. Be it Greco-Roman statesmen and academics, well-off merchants of the Wu, or even eccentric Englishmen of a post-Enlightenment Europe. The one thing that united them was wealth and a patronage for high art. In olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked on as something shocking, but now God knows, anything goes. In olden days, the high class were focused primarily on art. Beautiful villas of the Roman Empire, detailed paintings and pottery of the Chinese dynasties, even the Egyptians and their hieroglyphics. All patrons of the arts in their own ways. High culture of that time, and still to this day, is defined by being that of the creator, be it a poet, writer, or painter, the critic, someone with the skills to discern if their work is high culture, and the users, who accept and sometimes join with the critic to police the works of the creators. A bit of a mini ecosystem of the art world, but it's how we see stuff like patronage and hybrid art come about. Then the Dark Age and Age of Exploration came about, leading to a small increase in the amount of wealthy aristocrats and merchants. The landed dukes, kings, queens, and even viscounts of this era would commission art and partake in events that fed their social needs. Because if there's one thing certain about high society, it's a social subculture. Many aristocrats and influences of the time saw, and many still do to this day, high society as a way to forge alliances, create business connections, or even just a way to show off and become well known to your friend circle. These rich folk would use their own capital to partake in many trends as well. And while there are common ones like marrying your cousin or partaking in something the history books won't talk about, there are some that that one kid who learns factoids from YouTube videos will never stop talking about. Like tulip mania in the 1600s, when these flowers were seen as status symbols in a newly independent and rich Netherlands. 
Agrarian idealism in places like France and England, where the rich and royal dreamed about living a peaceful life as peasant farmers. Even the great Habsburg passed him within the main use of this newly gained wealth was always to flaunt that you had this wealth, even if you only had enough guineas to get a diamond encrusted chamber pot or but two Caribbean slaves to carry your sedan chair. One thing would continue to define the elite for this time as well the patronage of art. That's right, we're back at art now, and you thought we'd be talking about weird trends. Who do you think I am, Sam Onella? <laughs> Art history itself picks up greatly in the Renaissance, where churches and monarchs would commission artists to paint extravagant paintings of themselves or religion. A lot of this would stay the same up until the 19th century. In the Victorian era and America's Gilded Age, we can see the beginnings of the high culture we know. With an influx of new wealth and urbanization, many of these individuals needed to showcase their money through posing themselves as exotic and interesting. If you've seen videos like these, then you know where I'm going with this. Now, on a brief tangent in this video that is probably over 10 minutes long, Trends in the Victorian era would set the model for high cultures to follow. Obsessions of classical civilizations, a romanticism of some of the weirdest things I've ever seen, and even the birth of fandom as a subculture. That last one is not just stuck to high culture. But I do love to say that fandoms came about because of the Victorians. Not to mention it's where we get a cool little essay about high culture called Culture and Anarchy back in 1869. Matthew Arnold wrote it more from a political standpoint in some spots. What with the anarchy being mentioned at all? But he does have some takeaways that we still see in our modern high culture. Like how culture seeks to do away with classes, terms like Philistine, and even someone complaining about what's wrong with culture these days because of louts and stuck-ups. This idea from Arnold would continue to influence much of the modern thought on high culture up until the 50s. Times have changed. And we've often rewound the clock since the Puritans got a shock when they landed on Plymouth Rock. If today they should try to stem, instead of landing on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock would land on them. Times have changed, and quickly at that. Even in the short span between the Gilded Victorians and the new rich of the 20th century, we see the rise of new money to compete with the aristocrats and monopolists of old. What new money, you may ask? Well, the nouveau riche, the social class that came about thanks to the economic booms of the Gilded Age and Belle Epoque. Many of these new rich were industrialists and their families. A lot of them made their fortunes in this gilded age of peace and some continued to skyrocket through the 20s. Here we would see the interactions between old and new money that would continue to influence high culture even through to this day. High society doesn't really like disrupting the status quo, with new money being seen as being flashy and not maintaining the intelligence and sophistication of the older families. These new rich would do things like travel Europe on adventures to find themselves, or through throwing extravagant parties to win over the married woman across the water from your mansion. Even up to the Great Depression and World Wars, we would see something that- I do hate to interrupt, but what does this have to do with our high culture? We may be the most Victorian men in Lincolnshire, but neither of us has done any of these things. At least sober. Well, that little segue gets us into the differences between high culture and low, or well, popular culture of the late 20th century. Reginald. How does the bear cat know my name? Silence, Vicar. I have power over you both, as you are saying, bear cat. Thanks, Viscount, with a long name. With the rise of popular culture after the just as successful sequel to World War I, we would see a boom in everything not posh. A growing middle class made of veterans and blue and white collar workers, poor people getting a little boost in standard of living, and the rich holding strong to whatever they were doing in the 40s. I think it was something of rye fields and boarding schools. This boom of the middle class would help direct high culture into something that was seen as less reliant on the arts and patronage, and more on a flexing contest of what has the most cash value. But with this boom came more new money wealthy, and while these new wealthy were closer to lower upper class and upper middle class, they still wanted to shadow the rich culture they pretended to be a part of, with things like McMansions and sports cars being seen more as status symbols to these middle pretenders. This all helped create a new subclass of person called a yuppie. A yuppie? short for young professional urban youth, is the 80s version of social climbers yearning for new money. And through the 80s, we could see this subclass of the wealthy subculture try to aggressively carve themselves in the high culture, despite caring more about stimulation through things like business card fonts or how many figures were made. Not so much about the quality of art or the majesty of highbrow culture. A superficial take on wealth that most people presume nowadays is high culture. There is a brief tangent we're going to take before talking about the modern followers of high culture. Something that involves economic ups and downs, as well as the decline in high culture. But it's a good tangent, something you don't see much nowadays, especially with the ever-growing divide between the wealthy and the common people. 
But what if you want to live like common people? What if you want to do whatever common people do? Well, I'll see what I can do. Let's pretend that you've got no money. Oh well, a little money and a 90s Britpop song stuck in your head. What kind of thing do you want to buy to occupy your free time? This painting from the value section? Or this football? Or this football? Or this football? If you were lower class than my two aristocrat friends here, you'd say the footballs. And taste is something that seems to be a big factor between slobs and snobs. That is one of the defining differences between high and low culture. Would a rich and flamboyant see hybrid art like this as the new Duchamp or New Warhol, common people like me see it as some squares on a canvas. There is that distinct shift in class and intelligence between the two cultures. This is where popular culture can be seen more as a workers' culture, like a football game, or a football game, or a football game. Popular culture, as some describe it, is an aberration of commercial greed and public ignorance at what truly is fulfilling and entertaining. And while I can entertain the idea of companies trying to get as many dollars as possible, I also offer this argument. The only reason popular culture has existed is because of the monetary barrier between it and high culture. Think about it. Most of the niche stuff, be it cool or pretentious, needs you to get money. Things like supercars, cool houses, mascot costumes, or even just nice art for you to look at in your apartment above a 7-Eleven. Money is there because it's not in high demand. And if economics has taught me anything, the supply and demand are not even close to equal. Which means money can buy any weird taste or niche high culture desires, free of appealing to the masses. It's kind of like a spectrum. The more you want to make money off of it, the further from either mass appeal or complete niche you get. And at the opposite end of niche and high costs is where a lot of popular culture exists. Meaning that while urchins like myself are contempt in going to watch some blockbuster action movie or a good game of athletes moving objects, the upper class sees this as garish. And this goes back further than the 20th century. Maybe even the Victorians like we discussed earlier. Whilst the common folk had every kind of football, public executions, or whatever the medieval equivalent of a bop it is, BOP IT! Those of previous high cultures had poetic operas and plays, art, or even good old-fashioned peasant levies. That's almost harvesting season! I do implore what of high culture today. I regret to inform you that hobbies like peasant levying and eating mummies are out of vogue. Especially at the fine gentleman's club, where we are going tonight within the premises of Scunthorpe. Oh man, this day keeps getting better. I don't even have to try and find a segue between segments. Modern high culture is more... Postmodern than classical high culture. There isn't one blockbuster scam at the center of the art market. Rather, it's a market composed of scams. After a certain point, the more expensive a house is, the uglier it is to look at. That's seven for eight hundred sixty dollars. <laughs> Nowadays, anything goes. Just like those video examples, the high culture of today is steps away from what it used to be. And we've been seeing a lot of those same things happening since the 80s. Mostly because of the economic booms and bubbles. So the high culture of today is more of a hyper-capitalist dream, with the elite seeing art not as a way of expression or status, but as a way to get rich quick if you know the right people. There is also the issue facing high culture of the new rich. There's a critique in the art world of modern art being just a new way to get a tax write-off that someone can throw a couple thousand at an art appraiser to inflate the value of an upcoming artist, and walk away laughing as the appraiser friend only gives the artist a fifteenth of what it's worth. And that's led to a critique I'll touch upon later on the destruction of the term art. But anything is art if you have daddy's credit card and a lax disposition towards outsider artists. Of course, that would only lead to a decline in prestige, as the critics say. And the balance is decline in prestige are the people who fake having it. America's upper middle and some middle middle class denizens like to dress up their neighbors and friends that they have money, emulating the wealth of the next class up the ladder. A common occurrence in Western culture itself. After all, who wants people to think that they don't have money and therefore status? These new fake rich, whether it be out of FOMO or wanting to flex their close to six figure income, are such a surge on high culture. Be it from these fake rich buying whimsical classical works of art just to hang them on the dining room wall to impress the HOA, or the billionaires who use the art market as a tax write-off. There is no longer a connection between the patron and the artist like in the olden days, with the whole thing falling more to peacocking and quasi-money laundering. Not to mention that, fake or real rich, there is a subset of high culture that is just plain classism with a superiority complex. This wealth superiority is not uncommon, especially given the amount of wealth and privilege a lot of these people have, or at least pretend to have. But this superiority complex may change a lot in the coming years, 
as high culture may as well be on the decline, with what can be considered dilution of whatever top shelf bottled water we want to use for comparison. Since the late 90s, from what our sources have said, high culture has been on the decline, be it through post-postmodernism, a growing wealth gap, or just plain old change of taste among the elites. The subculture may dissolve completely in the coming decades. As pointed out by one article, our good friend Matthew Arnold may be to blame for this decline in the high culture he helped start. What once was a culture of the artist, patron, and critic was made to be into snobbery at the hands of Victorian thinkers. The high culture most of us know today came from it, and it can be said that us proles did benefit from not belonging to this version of high culture. Through programs initiated by wealthy folks wanting to civilize the Philistines, the average intelligence has gone up over the past century. Now, this might be more of a positive to those elites taking over our thoughts outside of tweeting random things, but this is part of class warfare. Yeah, it's time for me to put this Karl Marx brand hat on. The same class of proles that does get some benefits of high culture wanting to rub off on them is going to be put on a continuous disadvantage. While the high culture of old was more of a patronage for private or religious art, the latter helping illiterate peasants with cool church meals of stories, it now has become this repetitive tax write-off behind the fading venue of wealth and elegance instead of the art for the sake of art it once was. Not to mention that with an ever-growing wealth gap, high culture is becoming both something people yearn for and disdain at the same time. And high culture differentiates itself from the popular culture of wherever it sets up by being that niche and attracting people to yearn to live but one day in the lap of luxury. Only for that day never to come, thanks to the standards imposed through generations on the current beneficiaries of high culture. Like these two fine classists I'm riding in a carriage with. How dare you call us classes, you uncultured and unkept proletariat urchin! Letting Fordingston Smythe stop this courage! And so, Viscount Smithing Resington and the Vicar of Chapelbees threw the raccoon out of their carriage and into the streets of... Ugh, Scunthorpe. Well... I live here now. That's high culture for you. A culture by the artist, sold to the elites, and profited upon by both. It's more of a social art form than a physical one some days, but it does hold true to its roots. While modern high culture may be more of a tax write-off than it used to be, the culture itself still survives today and is defined by whatever is in vogue for the million and billionaires who have a little extra money to throw into the arts. But hey, as the old saying goes, it's a matter of taste. Now if only I could buy some art to wear upon my head. Oh hey, a fruppence! Now I can buy another hat. Everything's looking up for me! Oi, this urgent thing with fruppence! You can't have these things, Aaron. Scunthorpe. Let's get him! The Lincolnshire production of Subculture Shock was brought to you by the BBC's subsidiary, Derek. Coming up next, the one-man performance that has won over the Queen herself. Derek stars as himself in the BBC 17 original stage production of Core Blimey, They Gave Me a Whole Studio and 90 Million Quid. Then, at 11 o'clock tonight, watch as Derek fights for his life to win back his wealth and fame. With the new game show, Sought it, I've lost the 90 million quid they gave me to some raccoon. Now I had to make a game show called Quid Game. Let's get him! Master has given Dolby a sock! <laughs> Dolby is free! Fucking <laughs> sweet bud. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to your grandma's house and throw a croissant at your window. <laughs> <laughs>